Welcome to the LND Go Beyond podcast. To begin a fresh new year, we have the amazing Paddy Shank with us. Many of you would already know about Paddy well. Still, let me introduce our guest. Paddy Shank, PhD, is an internationally known workplace learning expert, instructional designer, researcher, and author who's regularly listed as one of the most influential people in digital and workplace learning internationally. She is the president at Learning Peaks and has been a research director at the Learning Guild, apart from being a faculty at multiple colleges. Patty has written several books on learning, namely, Write and Organize for Deeper Learning, Manage Memory for Deeper Learning, and Practice and Feedback for Deeper Learning. Her latest book is called Write Better Multiple Choice Questions to Assess Learning. I'm very excited to have Patty join us today to talk to us about her latest book on writing better multiple choice questions. Patty, very welcome to the podcast. Ahmed, I'm so glad to be here and thank you for having me. Our pleasure entirely. Uh, Patty, I'm, I'm intrigued. You know, this is one topic which I have been in the domain for close to two decades, but I haven't seen too many books on this topic. So I'm, no. I'm intrigued by what really brought this book around? What's been the background story of this? Well, the story is kind of interesting. I have been teaching multiple choice question classes for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And I did it because everyone I worked with who wanted to do multiple choice question tests uh, destroyed those questions. They were awful. Um, and so I did what I normally do. When something is obviously awful, I, I go to the research and say, what does research say about doing this well? I thought I knew the answers, mm -hmm. but I was wrong. <laughs> Even my own multiple choice questions had problems in them. And I ended up spending probably the last four years just reading everything on, on multiple choice questions and learning a lot about it um, and writing the book from it. I thought the book would be easy to write. It was the hardest book I've written by far because there are so many things in multiple choice questions which people think they know and mm. they don't. Mm. Mm. Very interesting, very interesting. So it's been a journey of discovery and learning yourself and now you have a great compilation which can hopefully help other learning designers you know, learn all of those in one place. The, the interesting thing about this is what you said first, which is there aren't many books. So when I was doing research on, on writing a book, should I write a book or are there are already 500 books out there on this topic? I found very few. Mm -hmm. And what I did find were books that, that a PhD would read, but your average instructional designer would get into it about one and a half pages and say, this is very academic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I read those books, but I knew that your average instructional designer probably wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's very uh, important because a lot of research is out there, but it is so academic that a lot of practitioners don't want to spend time on it. So it's, it's a great service in terms of bringing that relevant research in a great format so that you know people can consume and adapt it in their practices. Hmm, and I try really I try really hard to not be exhaustive because I know no one wants to read a book that's 500 pages long and it puts people off and it costs more. Yeah. And so what I try really hard to do with each book is to come up with the most important things and that, that your average instructional designer, or in this case, teacher, yeah. um, can use, and the book can be read in a couple hours. Yeah. Now, most this is not a simple book. So I, I imagine it, no one would sit down and read it in two hours, but, or three, or even four, but it's yeah. not hard. Yeah. So I've been through the book and I really appreciate the way it has been structured. Uh, there are assignments given. Uh, it kind of reinforces what you are learning through the, through the book. Yeah, very, very well structured and just the right length, as you said. Thank you. 
Fantastic. That's you know really interesting to know the, the background story. Let me start with a more generic observation about the topic, which is uh, around testing. Testing is not really considered desirable by many l &D teams, and I'm sure even by learners. You know, so when you create programs, sometimes l &D teams would want to tone down the tests and assessments for you know their own reasons. How how do you handle this overarching uh, objection, if I can call it? Well, it, and it's a really common objection. Um, I get I get email and notes from people who say, "Why are you handling?" the issue of multiple choice questions when they're terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and I get this all the time. And I actually wrote an article on this and it just came out on e-learning industry. Um, so if you put my name in, it'll be the, my, my latest article for them about misconceptions that people have about multiple choice testing that are not true. Um, and I'll give you one of them. Um, this is a big one. It's probably the biggest one that multiple choice tests can only assess recall. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody knows that that's kind of a silly thing to be assessing. Um, if we're going to use assessment, we, we want to assess. In fact, I write this in the book, and you may remember this, that the purpose of multiple choice questions is to assess the learning objectives. And so that goes down a whole bunch of different roads, yeah. but, but, but one of them is that, that if you're going to assess the learning objectives, look, first of all, we have to assess the learning objectives. That's the purpose of instruction. There's, there's two main issues there, right? One is, did people meet the learning objectives? Mm -hmm. If they didn't, well, something has to be done about that. We need to be able to answer that question. Did, did the people who took this course meet the learning objectives? And then if they didn't, we need to know what happened so that we can fix our courses. Because one, one of the things people think when they do L&D work is that our job is to build content. Our job is not to build content. We may build the content if necessary. Um, and often if we're building courses, we're also building content, but content's not enough where you have to build performance and skills. And if our instruction doesn't do that, then our instruction's not good enough. And we, we must know that. Um, and so that's the main reason for, for assessment. Does our course work? Does it do what we want it to do? Yeah. yeah. We, we, need, we need that answer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's one of the threads that I saw through the book, uh, which is that MCQs are probably your mechanism to uh, evaluate whether what you're trying to do is being achieved or not. You know, and learning objectives are probably the starting point. Uh, if you are not able to achieve what your learning objectives uh, were, then in any case, you know either your content is not right, your instruction is not right. Maybe or MCQs the learning objectives. Are, yeah. Right, yeah. right, exactly. And it took me a while to realize that. So the first three or four times I taught this course, people learned the mechanics of writing good multiple choice questions, but they were asking the wrong questions. Yeah. They were written well, mm -hmm. but they were the wrong questions. It was obvious to me. And so I, I sat down and thought about it and I realized they were just picking things out to ask questions mm -hmm. about like most people do now. Um, and that's not, it's not enough. Yeah. We have to write the right questions and, and we have to write them well. And so to write the right questions, we have to have performance-based learning objectives. If we don't have that, we don't know what to measure. Yeah, I, I really like that phrase, you know, performance-based learning objectives, because that <clears throat> kind of brings a focus to the kind of program you should be designing, because otherwise you can go haywire. And also it gives you direction towards a, a better structured assessment. You know, right, and, and it also, 
it also gives you your scope. Yeah. You know, and so many times scope is this big, it's huge because you ask a content expert or a subject matter expert to give you content and they give you everything they know about everything, including the history of something, which most people don't need to know. I'm not saying they never need to know. Sometimes they do, but, but if we don't have learning objectives, we don't have a scope, we don't know what people need to be able to know and do as a result of the instruction, and our assessments measure nothing. Mm. And therefore, well, as you said it, most people don't even do the assessments. Well, if we don't do the assess, if we don't do any assessments, we don't know anything about our course other than the course was built. Yeah. We, don't, we don't know if participants can do anything as a result of it. So we, we have to. Absolutely. It's basic. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so since you've been doing this, you know, uh, for so long, what are your observations on top two, three uh, issues with how typically MCQs are written uh, by most typically uh, learning designers or instructional designers in various roles? Right. Actually, I, I, I don't even have to guess what they are because there's research about that. Mm -hmm. So I, there's research, and it's in the book, I believe, about um, a nursing exam. Um, and 85%, and this is to measure, this is a certification exam for nurses who do anesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important because you can kill people um, if you can't do that job well. Um, and so they took this, they took this assessment and 85% of the questions had at least one really bad flaw. Um, and most of the flaws are in the answer choices. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you the ones that, that I see the most regularly. Um, the, mo the most regular one I see is that the question is unclear and doesn't, doesn't really relate to anything in particular. It's just taken from the content. It's just, it's just fluff, you know, mm -hmm. the date of something or, or the uh, terminology or that sort of thing. Unclear language is a big problem. If you write it unclearly, you're not testing what you think you're testing. Um, one of the biggest problems is distractors or mm -hmm. incorrect choices that are written impl implausibly. So people can pick them out as, oh, it's, it's not this one because it's silly. And it's not this one because it doesn't have anything to do with this. Yeah. Um, and they can, they can answer the question correctly by just getting rid of uh, poorly worded and bad, bad answer choices. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't want that. We, we want our distractors to be completely plausible so that anyone who is reading that cannot easily guess because yeah. we don't want guesses. We want whether people know or not. Excellent. Uh, in fact, that's going to be my next question on distractors. But uh, just to uh, recap, you said there are three uh, main things that I captured. One is uh, unclear questions, which may not be aligned well and not really testing what should be tested. Unclear right. language, which could be uh, confusing, could be, you know, not again testing what you want to test and poor choices or options, especially the un incorrect ones, which are <clears throat> mostly a giveaway, you know, so you can guess. Right. And mostly they are giveaways and that is 180 degrees opposite of what we need. Yeah. We don't want to make it easy to guess. We want, we want the only people who can get the correct answer are people who know the correct answer, not people who can eliminate poorly written ones. Excellent. So one point around distractors is that, when, so my question on this was, how good distractor, distractors can make MCQs more effective. One point that you've already said is that it avoids guessing. Yes, uh, and I, you, we, we want to, we have to avoid guessing. 
make Correct. it hard to guess. Correct. And so, is are there more things around distractors that uh, learning designers can possibly keep in mind when they are creating those uh, incorrect answer choices? Right. Um, and the big one is making all your answer choices the same length, mm -hmm. so that that if you have one answer choice that's really long and detailed and your other answer choices are short, um, people know that the long and more detailed one is usually the correct answer. Mm -hmm. So all of your answer choices should be the same length. Um, and there's one more um, for that. And that is to use for your typical multiple choice question to use two distractors, one correct answer, all the same length. Um, and, and, and the distractors should be plausible and there should be no clues anywhere. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I see that is one of the things that happens very regularly. You know, distractors are a clear giveaway most of the times. Right, and in which case your, your test scores are useless. Yeah, absolutely. You also talked about uh, formative and summative assessments in the book. And of course, uh, they should be handled differently. Is there uh, you know, one or two top differentiators that learning designers yeah. need to keep in mind for, while they're creating multiple choice questions for formative versus summative assessments? Right, you can use the same process for writing both of them but the feedback is generally different and it has a different purpose. Mm -hmm. So the, how you use the multiple choice question becomes different. In formative assessment, we are assessing people's understandings while instruction is in process so that we can fix mis misunderstandings. Um, we don't want people to get to an end of a course and have misunderstandings. So we want formative assessment and we tend to call this, many people call it knowledge checks. Mm -hmm. um, they're, not, they're not scored, um, they just get um, clear feedback on what's in the question and they may be given additional feedback, they may be given something else to read, but, but formative is, is in process instruction where we want to make sure, because we're only asking the most important questions, or should be, formative assessment makes, it hopefully gets people to summative assessment where they have no problem passing because they've already had a, a variety of formative assessment and, and we fixed any misunderstandings hmm. or missing understandings. Yeah, yeah, okay. So feedback becomes the core. The objective is, of course, uh, to correct, course correct, and uh, you know, uh, remove any confusions or misunderstandings as they prepare for the summative assessment. Right, and summative assessment feedback is not less important, mm -hmm. but most, but the research shows that that most people don't read it. They just want to know if they passed. Yeah, um, they're already done with the course. They don't care. Did I pass? Um, and that, you know, did I pass, did I get a, a reasonably good grade? Um, I would contend that it, feedback's just as important there because if they still have misunderstandings or missing understandings, do we want them to keep going um, and trying to learn the next thing while they still have misunderstandings about the previous thing? Mm -hmm. And usually the answer is no, but no one's talked about how to get get people to read summative assessments, so, uh, feedback the for feedback. summative assessments. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an answer for that one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've read one answer that I thought was good, and that was that you can increase your grade if if you read it and say what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't see in most instructional designers probably putting putting that into place in the workplace. Yeah. I wish they would. Mm. <clears throat> so that's, and that's a very interesting one, you know, to, to me, it also aligns with something which uh, some people call implementation intentions. So okay. once you have finished a program, what do you want to do? You know, if you can capture somewhere and 
<clears throat> I was speaking to uh, Dhirin Doshi, who, who's now, I don't know, uh, who's left Colgate, but he was with Colgate at the time in the logistics team. And he was saying they have implemented that very effectively in capturing Good. implementation intentions, which they can revisit after six weeks or even six months and managers and people can have a conversation around that, what's worked, what has not worked, etc. But very interesting idea, actually. Yes, it has not been it's, used much. It's not used much. Um, you know, there's so much that works in higher ed or K through 12 uh, uh, public school um, or, or in private schools that we should use, but we don't. Yeah. Um, for instance, reminding people over time of, of important things they've already learned so that they can remember and do, do spaced repetition. Yeah. But we can't even get people to do summative assessment. As you, as you noted early, we're not, you know, we're not there yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in general, you know, uh, is fit, feedback usually a missed opportunity? Because that's the time when, you know, people are probably more ready to learn, not the summative one, but at least the uh, formative ones. Yes, I think, I, I think so. I mean, how many times have you taken a course and it's helped you figure out what things you don't understand mm. and then helped you understand them? Because let's face it, we, we all go through a course with what we already know and we may, may come up with misunderstandings or missing understandings that will damage our ability to go forward or to use it. Mm. Um, and that's pretty, that's pretty important. We shouldn't be assessing simple things. We should be assessing the important things. Um, and feedback, feedback during formative assessment, the research is pretty clear that if we give the right kind of feedback at the right time during the course, people will be more willing to course correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just sounds like a good uh, handholding, guidance, and a better use of their time while they are in the program. Right. Yeah. How do we get people to do it, though? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, you you know you just talked about the right thing to assess, and one of the things I think in your book is about you know a simple way to test beyond the remember level is to ask people to use what they remember. Uh, can you right. elaborate a little more on that and how this can be used in, in learning design? Right. So let's say we're teaching people how to put a fire out in, in their house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're teaching this to, to parents of small children. Um, <clears throat> instead of asking the question, um, what, what combustibles, um, what, what materials would this type of fire extinguisher work on, we can give them a scenario and say, you're in the kitchen and you've, um, you've turned away to talk, to talk to your child and you turn back and the oil that you were heating up to fry something is catching on fire because you turned away for too long. What do you need to put that out? You know, so you actually put people, and they have to remember that that rem, that recall piece, but yeah. they have to do it in in the way that they would do it in real life. Mm. So uh, the the real trick is is converting it into some sort of a performance assessment rather than a recall or remember assessment. Right. Don't don't ask. Um, I'm trying to think. You know, don't don't ask what. Uh, materials you can use to, to clean, you know, which, which of the, these three materials um, mm. are good, are acceptable to use to clean the computer in the operating room. Mm -hmm. um, you give them a scenario. Um, somebody spilled something on the computer. Um, when can it be? You, and you can ask a bunch of questions about that. You take real life situations that people are going to find themselves in make sure they're important, make sure they're relevant. And they have to know the recall stuff to answer that question, but they have to do it in the same context that they do it in work. Mm. 
And th that automatically makes higher level questions. Uh, one area that I find very interesting is, and you've covered it in your book as well, around passing scores, which uh, most of the times are, you know, set quite arbitrarily. Maybe the LND team say 80%, 70% is what we want. Uh, are there more evolved scientific ways of putting passing scores or a process, if not, uh, you know, uh, a a device scientific method, but at least a process through which people can. There are scientific it. methods to do it also, and it it's time consuming. So if all you're doing is to see, if you're just assessing a course, um, if you're certifying, you're going to want to use a certifying skills. You're mm -hmm. going to want to use something that ha has higher validity than just assigning. And most people assign what, 80%? Um, that seems to be the big one, 80% right. Um, and it's like, what the research says is, whatever you set as your passing score is what you are saying is the adequate amount of performance capability. Mm -hmm. So if, if, let's say you were asking about, uh, you were, talking to people who clean operating rooms in a hospital and you were assessing their skills um, and you were using the question uh, on spills uh, on the computers because uh, operating rooms now have computers on them and what can you use to clean them and on that sort of thing. Is it okay? And, and you set your score at 80%. Is it okay if the people in the operating room who are doing that work only get eight, get that task right 80% of the time. And if it's not, you need to rethink your, so, so some of the methods that are used is by getting um, expert performers mm -hmm. and having them look at your, your test and say for each question, what should the performance level be? What it, what's needed is is it ninety percent ninety five you know with 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 doing sterile technique in an operating room eighty percent is not acceptable you know you you can make everyone sick yeah. and you know so so you can get a group of expert performers to actually chime in on what should be and it might be by question. Mm -hmm. That, that we expect 90, and, and there's, method, there's methods um, that describe this. If you look at setting cut scores, that's what the research calls it, cut scores, C-U-T, um, set, setting, uh, and you can try passing scores too, but most of the research I found said setting cut scores for important skills. Um, and there's a couple of methods, but, but um, an easy one is just to find 10 very good performers to look at your test and say on each question, what should an adequate, what percentage of, of performers who take this should get this correct if, if, if they're competent? Yeah. And, then, and then you average all that in. Sure. So it may so turn out that, uh, you know, if you have an assessment which has got overall about 10 questions there may be two or three on which you should get it right to be you know minimally acceptable performance level on the job but there may yeah. be others which you know could be a little lesser than that right right so so i mean the main the main thought here is when you're thinking about your your passing score make it equal to what you think people should need to perform at in order to, to have adequate skills. Mm -hmm. You know, don't just set it at 80% or yeah. 75 or whatever, <laughs> because what does that mean? Yeah. It, 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 do, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean what you think it means. And there's another way where, where your test can be called into question and the results are useless. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it might be demotivating as well if, if the actual performance required is just 
let's say 50 percent depending on the level of assessment that you have set and your best performers are not able to get 80 percent which is a passing score they are essentially getting demotivated to say you know i am praised by my managers for the work that i do but i can't pass this assessment so right and and you bring up a really good point is that if you've got good performers and they take the test one they're going to tell you things that are wrong about the test which is really <laughs> a good idea and look we don't really want our our two or three experts to take the test they don't perform the way other people do they perform differently um, and because because of their expertise but we get people who are competent we know they're competent give 10 of them the test if they they should all be able to pass it easily and if they're competent but not expert, we will want people to get about the same score, yeah. you know, because we want them to be at the same level of competency. Now, let's say your really competent performers get a 92. Um, and so that's starting to tell you that, that if someone's really competent, but where are they in the learning process? If they're just learning it, they're not probably gonna get a 92. Um, and, but it gives you some idea of, of what you can expect. If, if they don't pass the test, then, then you've got a problem. And, and it's a problem you need to, you need to fix, right? Yeah. You know, no. your, te your test is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> True, absolutely. Yeah, if, you're, if your best performance can't, uh, pass that easily there is a problem definitely and and chances are if they all get a hundred then you have to look and see if it's too easy hmm. um if it's all recall questions which tend to be lower level they should get a hundred no problem um you know so so these these things one one of the fascinating things about multiple choice questions is there's so much nuance yeah yeah yeah, absolutely. Also, uh, you, you talk of something called complex MCQs and you recommend against using them. So could you, could you share a little more about what is a complex MCQ and what, why should it be avoided? Well, they're nightmares is what they are. And they, they came out of the medical industry um, where, where they would have a question and usually three or four answers and then under that, they'd have more like A and B, A and C, <laughs> C and D, none of the above, all of the above, mm -hmm. and, you know, where, where you're combining answers. Um, and pretty much everybody says, all the researchers say that question, that question type is so hard, it could take someone I don't know, 10 minutes to try to even figure it out. And you've lost the efficiency that you get with multiple choice. Hmm. So that's the, that's the one that's out. Um, there's caveats about other, other types of multiple choice questions, like questions that ask people to select more than one. And, and I learned a lot about this reading the research is that those are much harder um, then select the correct answer. Um, so we should use less of those and only use them for questions where the learning objective requires us to pick multiple, multiple answers. Sure, yeah. Yeah, uh, I can imagine I, I, I would have seen some of those complex multiple choice questions in the past. <clears throat> Still see them. Yeah. You still you so and and somebody told me recently that each one of their questions had six answers plus none of the above and 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 all of the above hmm. and it's like well are you going to ask just three questions then because you now have a thirty minute test from three questions yeah it takes uh, substantial time it kind of breaks the momentum it is. Uh, yeah, I think it can be a little confusing. It's confusing. And one of the things we don't want to give people clues and we don't want it to be to make questions harder than the actual task. Yeah. 
we want to, those questions to be the actual task. Absolutely. We want to put them in a situation <clears throat> where they have to think about the actual task like they do on the job. Yeah. It's like, you know, uh, what are you trying to test? Are there analytical skills about, you know, the options given and how complex you've made it and how quickly they can resolve that? Uh, this is almost like in early days of uh, digital learning, you know, uh, people would make things where learners had to click on really small hit areas. So right. you know, are you testing knowledge? Where are they clicking? Or are you seeing how well they seeing, can find the mouse? Right. What what is their fine motor skill ability? Absolutely. And and that's another big thing that comes up. What are we actually testing? So when I said earlier, hard language, complex language, difficult language, we want to keep that out as much as possible because we are we don't want to be testing someone's reading skills. Hmm. We want to test whether they can do the task. Yep. Fantastic. Patty, I want to return to uh, uh, one earlier topic, which was on learning objectives. And we talked about, you know, they need, the assessments need to be well aligned with those. But you also talk about writing good learning objectives is a prerequisite. So do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what in your view is a good way to write good learning objectives? Right. Um, to not take too much time, I'll tell you what, what the, why we why we're doing this and probably my biggest hint on this and we're doing this because if we don't know what people on the job and i'm talking about workplace learning if we don't know what people on the job need to be able to do then we don't know what to test um, and so the most important thing about writing learning objectives um, and I've got a methodology, um, the ABCD method, which stands for audience behavior, um, context and degree, which is how do we know when they've done it? Um, and um, this is explained in a whole chapter. It gives us what we need to know what to test. Um, and the most important thing we need is to understand the tasks on the job. So if, if somebody just hands us materials, we don't know what to test because we don't understand the job. We need to understand the job to know what the learning objectives are. And those learning objectives tell us what to test. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's very neat and all wrapped up. And it goes even further than that. It, it also tells us what to teach. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> right. <clears throat> that's, that's exactly the, the point that I think uh, is a big takeaway here, that while we may see multiple choice questions or assessments at the fag end of the activity sometimes, if you have to do it well, you have to do everything right from the beginning. Like you said, yes. unless you understand the tasks, Unless you, you know, go deep into that and do that analysis, you will not be able to write the right, correct learning objectives or good learning objectives. Unless you have that, you can't have good assessments. And how will you measure success if you don't have good assessments? So okay. while it looks at, uh, you know, an afterthought for some people, MCQs still, it is something that should begin at the very beginning from the analysis, right. knowing the task and writing good learning right. objectives. So, so if we do that, and, and for anyone watching, what you just said is one of the most important things ever. I mean, I think ever in, in developing instruction is you have to start with what people need to be able to do, which is, ends up being your learning objective. If you don't know that, you're just pushing content at people and you're wasting their time instead of giving them if you, write the, if you write the learning objectives first, then you know what to assess and you know what, what to teach. And, and the assessment tells, tells us, you and I, our stakeholders and everyone, does this course work? Yeah. And if it doesn't, that's fine. Because yeah. when we first teach a course, when I first wrote my multiple choice course, 
it wasn't even nearly as good as it is now because I learned by teaching it what were what helped people get there. Um, people will go into my course now and they actually have to write learning objectives for a whole bunch of things all the way through my course. Um, and people come out and say, I know what to do now. Whereas in the beginning, they passed the test, but they weren't sure exactly what to do. And now, now because I've, I've spent so much time on this and refined the learning objectives, um, I mean, it's simple. One is write good learning objectives. Two is use the learning objectives to write, to write good multiple choice questions. Those are my objectives, um, but I started out a little bit fuzzier than that. And now, now people tell me they come out, they can write multiple choice questions. Mm, fantastic, fantastic. And so, so there's nothing wrong with our beginning courses not working as well as they should um, because we learn from the assessments how to fix them. Yeah. In fact, that's, that's another uh, important takeaway for the learning designers you know, who may be striving for perfection and hoping that everything will be right in the first go. The, the process itself has its own self-correcting mechanism if we adapt to it and accept it, that right. this is how we can continue to improve. Right, and I realize that not every course requires this level of a continual improvement. Um, you know, you're putting out a course about the new benefits and and um, what what things mean or terminology or you know, whatever it is, it's not, it, it, it's, everything's important, but some things are much more important. Um, you know, this level of effort where we're continually improving something is for the, the most important skills. Hmm. But it's been a fantastic, uh, very, very insightful conversation. I've learned so Thank much, uh, both from your book and from this conversation today. I'm sure our audiences will find it very interesting. And well, they'll take away a lot of things. Feel free to, to give them my email address. Um, I, I love getting questions from people who've read my book because it helps me figure out what's, what version two needs to have in it. <laughs> fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. Thank you so much, Patty, once again. I really appreciate Thank your you. time today and for all the wisdom that you were able to share to us and our audiences. Real pleasure. Amit, thank, thank you. you so much for having me.